I remember this distinctly. It was the summer that I was graduating high school. I was working construction. I had a, a pretty severe fall, was laid up for quite a while after that accident and really didn't know where life was going to take me. I'm curious about that. What's your background? So my background in, and this really, I think it was in December, I forget which one of your podcasts it was where you had somebody interviewing you. So my background in, I'd say I, growing up outside of Philadelphia, kind of the middle of nowhere, farm country, very, very humble means. And, you know, to be sitting here today doing what I do in this industry was just something that it, it wasn't even an imagination or, or a dream. You know, I, my father worked in a factory and, and, you know, it was, it was either farming, you know, the one or two factories that existed in the area, or you, you were construction. And even through most of, you know, my early years, you know, middle school, high school, it was, you know, construction. And, and I didn't really know what the path was for me. And, you know, this is, this is showing my age, but early eighties and, and it's going to sound cliche, but it's not, it was, it was the movie war games with Matthew Broderick. And, you know, I'd been exposed through like the, you know, the, the Commodore 64, the Apple two C, you know, the Texas instruments TI, I was already starting to, you know, do small programs, but the interconnectedness, you know, of computers, it wasn't just about you know, the concept of the movie itself and, you know, using computers, but the, the interconnected nature is what really intrigued me and, and drove me forward. Um, and, and I, I kind of always kept that skill up. I was always learning about it wherever I could in the school system that I was part of. If, if, you know, if I wasn't in a classroom, I was literally in the lab tinkering around and having fun. That led to the point where and again, this is dating myself, like, you know, PC clones, right? Building clones, helping to do support for neighbors or people I knew doing, you know, upgrades, like, like learning the inner workings. And I remember this distinctly. It was the summer that I was graduating high school. I was working construction. I had a, a pretty severe fall, um, ended up fracturing the last three vertebrae in my back. So we were doing house framing and it's heavy, hard manual work. Um, was laid up for quite a while after that accident and really didn't know where life was going to take me. And this, this family friend, it was just, you know, this, I don't want to say stroke of luck, but, you know, he knew that I was into technology and I had been tinkering around with computers and was really smart. And I had helped him, you know, with a bunch of things. And he said, you know, I, like, I know this guy, he's, you know, doing X and Y and Z. And I didn't understand any of it at the time. I'll explain it, you know, at a large pharmaceutical company, you know, why don't you go talk to him? He's, he's always complaining about, you know, the IT support he gets there and he's looking to just hire someone to be his, his jack of all trades. So I went on this interview, I go to this building that was probably an hour and a half, two hours from my house. It's this, you know, amazing headquarters building. I, you know, had never seen anything like it. I sit down with this gentleman who's the head of their treasury function. I couldn't have even told you at that time what that meant. And he's like, you know, I want somebody to do X. I want somebody to do Y. I want somebody to do Z. You know, I was like a deer in headlights the whole time. I, before I even got home, there was a message on my machine that I had the job and when could I start? And two weeks later, I'm out there, I'm figuring out how to buy suits, how to buy ties, what this is even going to be like. I'm scared. I'm nervous. I don't think I'm sleeping at all. So I end up working for this gentleman who was the head of treasury at a very well-known, at the time, the largest pharmaceutical firm. And he basically has me doing everything from getting them kind of set up on certain corporate systems, but, but specifically working on at the time, which I... I didn't even really understand it, which was performance attribution system, shadow accounting. So basically he was in charge of all the investable assets, pension funds, other money for this firm where they work with a lot of outside institutions to do those investments, but it's his responsibility to watch those institutions and pick those institutions and understand what they're doing. So an internal investment management team. So working on these systems, doing programming, DBA work, I mean, help desk work, I was, I was doing it all. And for, 
years I did this. And it was just this, you know, amazing opportunity to go from, you know, thinking, you know, at one point in my life, I'd just be living in this small town and working at a factory. And I had no idea, you know, where the doors that would open and where that would lead to. And, and I'm still in touch with this gentleman today as like a, you know, a mentor who did so much for me and how I pivoted into financial services. So that was like financial services within a pharma company is one day, and this is after about five years, he came to me and he said, look, you could stay here and you can continue to make, you know, $30,000 a year, or I can make some calls with some friends of mine on Wall Street and you can go do this in a firm that's actually going to move at a faster pace. They're going to pay you more money to do it. It's going to be way more exciting. Um, and he made some calls and I went on some interviews and, and that again, that relationship, that mentorship with him opened a door for me that just then, you know, dropped me in to a team that at the time, and this is now the, the late nineties, a team in a very large financial services firm. In fact, you know, like doing such cutting edge and innovative stuff at the time within the industry. Um, in Bill Gates' first book called Business at the Speed of Thought, there's a chapter, you know, in that book about this team within this firm and the innovative work they were doing, the patents that were being developed. And, you know, I, I literally end up in this team that just, you know, changed even, even more my life and, and working for just brilliant minds and, and brilliant people. So, you know, when I say our backgrounds are similar, you know, hearing your own journey and, and your own history, um, it was, it was touching to me. It was meaningful to me because I was like, man, a, a lot of what, you know, had got Joel got his start and what dropped him into technology was, was I think in a, a similar way of how I got dropped into this. Oh yeah. And it's almost like your life is on this one track and then this big thing happens and it's redirection detour. Yeah. So. Yeah. All, all through, uh, all through a fall uh, really that's what did it for me. A, a bad accident. Oh. And so you are working at these companies, you work on this amazing team. Where do you go from there? So, so yeah, I, so I land in this team um, at a large financial services firm, still one of the largest wealth managers out there. Um, some of the first projects I work on, and again, this is dating myself, was uh, this firm had been the, the, the investment banker of Research Emotion, so BlackBerry. So some of the first blackberries that were off the production line ended up at this firm. Three of them that came in, one ended up, at, up in my hands. And I was given the charter of like, look, what else can we do with this besides email? The guy I worked for actually thought, you know, mobile email was going to be kind of foolish. And he was a very visionary guy. But he's like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do X and Y and Z and, and deliver some more meaningful content on these? And so at that time, I was literally figuring out how we could do XML off of, off of mainframe transactions. So off of CICS transactions to get data out of the frame and deliver it up to these devices in a, in a fairly secure manner, I'd say, um, worked on that for quite a while, I actually worked between the retail wealth side and the investment bank on just really mobile that Blackberries turned into Palm pilots, turned into this, that, and the other thing. And so I really was building a niche around, you know, the, the design, the engineering around what we were doing as a firm with, with mobility internally. And then that led to what we were doing with our, eventually our clients, you know, through the online banking and broker side. And before I left that firm, you know, just through engineering and, and architecture, I actually ended up taking over what would have been the core integration security framework for one of the largest online banking and brokerage sites at the time. Um, of a large wealth manager. And, you know, that experience, you know, getting to, you know, have senior executives from a, a Microsoft, a, a Cisco, I mean, you name it, you know, almost on speed dial to, to help us out, to look at the coolest stuff, to be, you know, wherever we could be on the, on the cutting edge. And so when, when I left there um, from that firm, I took a break for a while. I was now running a large engineering team, like I mentioned, for kind of their core frameworks. I took a step back. I moved out to the the West Coast. It was, um, I, I had burned myself out after seven years, you know, 80, 100 hour weeks. Um, ended up through, through, again, through relationships. And I always tell people this, like my career 
has never been through a recruiter. It's always been through people I know. And I, I tell young people this, I tell people this I work with now, people will never remember what you did. All they will remember is how you got it done and how you treated other people. And, and that's literally going back to like the early 2000s, you know, someone had taught me that and it stuck with me. So I move out to the West Coast in San Francisco. I end up through a relationship, getting a job at a very large global asset management firm where I'm running engineering for all of their trading systems, all of their investment systems around the world. Um, and, you know, and, and that's led to leading other, you know, large engineering teams all within the wealth management or financial services industry. And it's just been this, this honor and joy that's been based on the fact of, you know, getting to travel around the world, getting to interact with so many smart and bright people, having mentors that to this day, and I'll, I, I really want to give a shout out to one is because it is International Women's Day. Um, the CIO of that large asset management company, who was my boss the whole time I was there, Priscilla Moyer. I mean, this is a person that I haven't, I haven't worked there in, you know, 10 plus years, but I'm still closer to there to this day. And, you know, I think those relationships, that mentorship, um, you know, really getting the right opportunities. And I tell people this, it's, it's never been luck. Luck is, is always a little piece of it, but it, it comes down to being able to take risks and it, it comes down to also hard work. It's a lot of things at once, right? Yeah. What did Priscilla teach you? What's one of the big takeaways? I know you've had a long relationship there, but what was yeah. one of the first ones? I think the thing that she taught me the most was to get my emotions under control and to mm -hmm. not react to things and, and start to display more of an executive presence, even when the, the world was falling down, you know, so to speak of, you know, a major production issue systems being down is keep your cool, hold it together, get through it, be the, be the one with, with fortitude. I think that's, that's one. And the second thing, you know, I had always early on had developed a love for this industry and a love for this business. Um, but the, the, the encouragement she always gave me around leveraging that knowledge you know, understanding this industry, it's, it's not just about the systems themselves, but it's how the systems are really enabling, you know, a business. And then those relationships that you need to maintain with those business partners. You, so, I mean, those, those are the things that, that just being under her leadership were just so meaningful to me. No, it sounds like amazing. Like when I started to do these interviews and talk to all of these different technical leaders, I got a huge spectrum of yeah. different leadership styles, right? All the way from throwing stuff in engineering meetings against the wall and breaking lamps to, in, you know, the, the coolest, calmest person in the world that you can barely hear speak. And so it's been such a, such a range that I've come to find it's more of a, an art given the context of the current people that you're with. Because I've heard people, um, one of the, more interesting pieces of advice that runs through my head from time to time, and maybe you'll help me have some perspective on this for balance, is somebody had told me, I can't remember who, but I respected them a lot, to give people reactions because they'll remember the reactions. But that's a, a pretty open-ended, that's a loaded gun, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, what type of reaction? How big of reaction? How often do you do this? And so when you're because you have experience working to control your emotions and develop a more executive presence. Can you help share some of like the, like something real and tangible that people listening can, can learn from? Boy, if I, if I, if I follow your, your question properly, I, I think it, it, it comes down to empathy, right? It's, it's not all about you. And so whether it's, you know, somebody meeting you new for the first time and, and even in an interview, right? It's, a, it's, how do you build a connection with that person by listening to them, by understanding who they are? And we all naturally, right? When, you know, you ask me a question, I have to think for a minute. I think of my response. Maybe I'm already thinking about the next thing that I want to say and I want to interject and I want to tell you, but to really stop yourself and, and again, build a rapport but understand the people on the other side. And that could be in any situation. It could be teams you're leading. It could be new people you're working with. Um, I think that, that that stands out the most to me about being a human. And it's tough. 
I have done 600 plus interviews and the name of the game is being quiet and and letting the other person speak. (laughs) Totally. So how did you end up at Edward Jones? So I ended up at Edward Jones um, during the pandemic. So the the CIO here, the chief information officer, is a person I, I worked for before in another firm. Um, I had known him casually even, you know, before that. And, you know, he's somebody I respected. And I was, you know, in a state where my wife and I were going to be leaving one area of the country and, and moving to another. We had a, a baby on the way. It was our first child. And we wanted to be close to family. We wanted to be close to where she's from. And so we were putting all that in order. And, you know, I reached out to him and was just catching up personally. And, you know, he used it as a great opportunity to say, hey, you know, we had talked before, you know, this is an amazing place with great people and it's, it's purpose-driven and we're going through, we're kicking off a, a, you know, a large, large digital transformation. Can you just meet with a few folks? And, and I wasn't looking at the time and, you know, I had three interviews and I was like, wow. And then I had three more and I was like, wow. And then I had three more and I was like, wow. And it went on for almost five months because they were taking their time to make sure I was the right fit for, for Edward Jones. And, and I was going through the process because I wasn't looking and I wanted to make sure that Edward Jones was really going to be the right spot for, for me and, and where I could finish my career. And, and I don't want to say I was on the fence, but it was really the very last interview I had with, with our managing partner at the firm, who's Penny Pennington, where it, it just sealed it for me. I mean, I was like, you know, a purpose-driven culture, a firm that has been amazingly successful for a hundred years. We just celebrated our centennial and they're already talking about how and what they need to do to continue to be successful for another hundred years. And that's what sold it for me. And that's how I, I, I came here and, and it's, you know, career wise, it's, it's one of the best decision I, I ever made coming into this organization. Who is the CIO? So the CIO is, is Frank LaQuinta. How did you meet Frank? So I knew Frank casually, um, at the first big financial services firm I, I worked at, and then we got reintroduced back in, um, I think it was 2013, um, when I was still living on the West coast and, um, he was at a, another large global firm as the CIO and they were going to be going through a transformation at the time themselves. And, and we got connected and, and it worked and I ended up, you know, go, going there and, and, and working under his, uh, under his leadership and have always learned a ton from him. And even to this day here at Edward Jones, I still do. So that in initial engagement of you working under his leadership, that's how you built the trust for later in life when an opportunity comes up, he could pull you in. Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to, it's never about what you did. It's, it's how you did it and how you treat, you know, other people and how the work gets done that, that stands out for anybody. I agree. I learned that lesson in my mid twenties when I heard a motivational speaker person say that people don't remember what you say. They just remember like how, how you said it. Right. And I thought about it and they gave some working example of think about the last three conversations you've had recite a sentence or two from any of them and you really can't, it's very difficult, but then think about how you feel after talking with that person and you can instantly remember how you feel about that person. Yeah. You know, I, I give that advice to other people when they're nervous in public speaking. I go, just Mm -hmm. remember there could be a thousand people in the audience, but probably only four or five are even listening at any given second and even really deeply seeing if you mess something up. So, so never let it stress you out. Have you done a lot of public speaking? I have, I have. It's something I'm, I'm, as much as I've done it, we all still get, you know, we all still get nervous. We all still get the, the jitters. I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in prep. I've, uh, you know, I, I presented here recently, did a fireside chat at our, our annual partners meeting, but I've done presentations to boards. I've done presentations to VCs, you know, I've done presentations to, to senior people when I was at an earlier part of my career that I don't even think I should have been allowed to talk to. And, um, 
but it goes, it goes back to that human element of what we do, you know, getting stuck in the bits and bites is, is totally fine for certain people. And, and I totally respect that. Um, but you know, for people that want to move up, they, they want to be leaders in an organization, you know, even a role like, you know, working in, you know, as an enterprise architect, right. You, you have to be able to influence, you have to be able to, to talk to people and, and to understand and to, you know, have some cachet, have some gravitas, you know, with an audience. So there's, there's, there's a place for, for both sides and, you know, in, in what we do as an industry, but, you know, I think the, the people, people skills are, are important for, for anybody who wants to rise into leadership. I agree. Four days a week, I have a one hour block and it alternates. So two of the days are writing practice and two of the days are speaking practice. Oh, that's great. That's helped a lot. I've been doing that for about four months now. Yeah. My, my written could always, uh, could always use a little bit more help. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fully agree. Yeah. I definitely, Gary V is a marketing guy, one of the people that inspired me to, to do the podcast in the first place. And he had been very clear about find your medium that you prefer yeah. the most and you can have other people translate the content. So I can have people make you know, uh, books or articles from the conversations that we have. Yeah. Definitely talking to people is my preferred medium. Me too. So what type of projects are you working on now that you're allowed to talk about? Yeah. So, so the first two years I was here, my main responsibility was software engineering, engineering for really what are our, the, the tools and systems that our, our branch teams, our financial advisors use. Um, also what our clients use. So like our, our mobile apps are, you know, online platforms, but then our operational platform. So how we process trades, how we move money, our books and records, and even, even our core investment system. So, you know, really fun, uh, really wonderful, you know, team of, of, of engineers of about, a, about a thousand people. And recently, just this year, I was given the opportunity to step into a, a different leadership role, running the firm's enterprise infrastructure and, and architecture. So, um, you know, now focused on, you know, areas, uh, from an architectural perspective, you know, what is, what is the five-year roadmap look like? So, you know, where are we going to continue to invest? What makes sense to invest from a, a functional perspective? So something that, you know, needs an upgrade that's important to the sperm, something that needs, you know, a, a non-functional upgrade. So maybe an elimination of, of, of tech debt, you know, where are we really going from a compute perspective? you know, a digital experience on, from the, the end user perspective, you know, is that going to be virtual? Is that going to be mobile? Um, but the, you know, what, what stands out to me and, and just because I have a team here in St. Louis doing some offsites around it today is, is really our move to, you know, and, and I shouldn't say move because we've already moved there, but really continue to refine our strategy, but also our execution plan for infrastructure as a service and, and platform as a service. So, you know, a lot of times to me, you know, I, I think people just simplify it and think it's, you know, it's just moving some applications into, you know, Azure or, or AWS. Um, but for, for many of your listeners and, and folks that you've had on that you've interviewed, it's, it's, it's much, it's much deep, deeper than that, right. To change that whole application delivery mindset, that architectural mindset, that even, even the, the shift within how disaster recovery needs to happen. So, you know, those pieces right now from an architecture and infrastructure perspective are, are really top of mind to me, um, but, but objectives and priorities for the firm. And then are you, I've got some deeper questions, but I want to yeah. clarify some stuff first. Yeah. Are you a direct report to your CIO? Yes, I am. Yeah. How do you connect your five-year roadmap within your teams to what they want? So that's a, that's a really good question. I think the, when I'm talking about five-year roadmaps, I'm actually talking about at the enterprise level. So not just for our infrastructure team. So we shifted within the last couple of years in our new ways of working towards, you know, a product model. So functioning more like a commercial software firm, you know, durable teams where necessary, starting to think about, you know, a, a piece of software 
but now even an infrastructure system as it's a living, breathing thing. So what's its life going to be? Who's the product owner of it? Um, you know, what needs to go into it? What doesn't? So whether it's software, whether it's infrastructure, that shift into product management, I think naturally drives a lot of those roadmaps. The pieces that I'm talking about at a five-year level are, are really at, at a, I'd say a, a more strategic view around what, where, why those investments need to happen. And so if I think about an investment that some people could take for granted today, like, you know, moving, you know, off of, let's say, a, you know, a physical piece of hardware, you know, with a, a local operating systems and saying everything's going to be a, a non-persistent virtual connection, you know, up in the cloud to, to do your work in a secure manner, you know, that's a roadmap to get there, right? But along the way of that roadmap, what things start to fall away? What things do we not have to support anymore? That investment you're making now, where does that investment start to pay off in the longer term? And then what other elements of technology that correlate to it do we think we're gonna need to make that investment in? So part of it is really to set the vision and reflect the strategy to senior leaders, um, but even create a, a financial picture around what those investments mean now and what they mean in the future. And as you're going through this planning, you obviously have a ton of brilliant people around you. Recently, I've been seeing, I, I get to see companies all the time, right? Yeah. And I started recently seeing a lot of research, IT, consulting type companies. It looks from the outside, obviously, a lot of the agency's websites are fairly ambiguous, right? But it looks like they're doing a lot of research and I was curious, are you utilizing any third party research or internal research when making these decisions? Or are you just finding the brightest people within your team and saying, hey, what, what should we do? So we do, we do use third party sometimes in that element of, of research. I mean, there's obvious ones that everybody uses. If I am want to see a, a, a ranking and rating of low code, no code platforms, you know, I can go out to Gartner, right? And I can look up what their, their ranking is of those. We can lean on, you know, partners and, and firms around, you know, how, how have you done this? How have you done that? You know, ultimately, I just, I think it comes from, from surrounding yourself with, with really bright people that have diverse mindsets, come from different backgrounds, you know, the people that have been here 30 years, I love just as much as the people that have been here three months because they bring so much different perspective together. And I really feel most of it happens within an organization rather than outside. What's the thing that you're learning most this year? Um, the thing I'm learning most this year is for myself and my teams. It's... Uh, you have to be the the CEO of your own destiny and and that destiny in, in the workplace is our development plans. It's how we, you know, get trained, how we continue to evolve, how we, we continue to, to learn. Um, and then everybody, you know, just really embracing the, you know, the, the purpose of, of this firm. And, you know, our, our, our purpose is about, you know, it's about positive impact. It's around serving our clients. It's around serving our communities all for the better. But that has to translate down to everything that we do. So whether I'm, you know, the person administering in virtual environments on the, you know, the engineer that's working on UX components on the architect, you know, who's thinking how to solve problem X or Y or Z, or, you know, I'm the person on the front line doing level one, you know, support for, for clients and advisors, you know, having that purpose, you know, of what the firm is really about and what we're doing is, you know, is, is gotta be number one. And then, you know, that, that aspect that I talked about earlier with, you know, being the own CEO of your development, people have to take time to, to grow, to, to learn, to think. I mean, I love what you said around spending that time to think about your own verbal and, and written development. You know, I'm a big fan of if people have to make that work will, can, what we do, you will get consumed, right? You know, it's can be eight hour days, 10 hour days, and then you have something that breaks in the middle of the night and then you have people on calls or on a weekend, but you got to charge, you got to carve out downtime to, to think, to get organized. 
I fully agree. And to your point about communication, can I share a small story? Yeah. Something I'm learning? Okay. So my background, you know, software engineering to entrepreneur. And so my early career was just working with engineers. And there was this common, I guess, trope, uh, this idea that, you know, they're bad at speaking, communicating. They're really good. They can do good work. But the people who can communicate better get farther ahead, right? Because they can communicate the value of their work and connect those things to the people uh, above running the company. I thought that that was isolated because of maybe introversion. That principle um, wasn't being learned because of that. But what I have found now as our company has expanded here at the podcast and we are working with clients and building them shows and doing all of that, we build about 15, 20 shows for other companies. And that's new for us in the past year and a half. So what we've learned there is the same thing, but it's with creatives, like all types of different creatives from very introverted people to very not introverted people. Yeah. This principle, this understanding of you did the work so you feel good about it and you think the work should speak for itself versus your ability to actually communicate what was done and how that brought value. That's something all humans have to work on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I love that, Joel. It's... um it's, it's, it's the outcomes, right? And, and this is where, you know, I know these, these words get so overused in, in our industry now of technology, but like it's, it, what was really the experience, right? You know, you could have built something that, you know, checked this box and it checked that box and it checked that box, but the person who's sitting, let's say using that application or interacting with that piece of technology hates it. You, you have to think about that experience. You have to think about what was the intended outcome but then listen to that feedback, right? And and that's why when when I think about, you know, product management, right, as a as a discipline within, you know, within software, but also within infrastructure, it's really getting focused on ultimately that feedback loop along the way of the experience and 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 what someone's interaction with it was. And as you're working with these people to help achieve this high quality experience, I'm always working on patience. You have more professional experience than me. Does that get any easier or is that just core to who I am? Uh, I don't think, I don't think it gets any easier. Yeah. I think certain people are, and I don't know if this is the right way to describe it. And there's, there's not one is bad and, and one is good but you're either type A and you're either chomping at the bit and biting on your nails or you're, you're type B and you can sit back and, and be a little bit more relaxed. I just think that's the way you're woven or, or I'm woven. Yeah, I get depressed at type B. Like I'm, I'm definitely type A. I have a, over there behind my camera is a checklist of the projects that I'm hyper-focused on. And it's kind of funny. I was actually thinking about this this morning uh, I'm working with this copywriter and I'm very specific said, Hey, I want you to come in and do these, these, you know, two very specific things. I've, here's the checkbox on my to-do list. It says, I need someone who can come in and a couple hours a week, improve the email sequences we use for sales, email outreach, just tinker with it, have fun, do whatever it is that you do. And then the second box I have checked is I need a KPI, some sort of maybe th no more than three things to watch and then just report on that week over week. <clears throat> it's been like five or six days. You know, she came in, she talked with the team, she went through these exercises and all this stuff. And every morning I wake up and from their perspective, they're all doing a bunch of good work. But from my perspective, there's been seven mornings I woke up and my check boxes aren't checked. And I'm trying to play it cool and, and work on this a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I love that. I'm the same way. I, I, have to force myself not to be that way in, in, in the professional world because, and, and I, it, it kind of leads into then being a micromanager, right? So if, if I love to be very organized, I love to use one note to keep track of everything I want to talk to different people about what I want to accomplish during a week, what the overall objectives are for the next six months and be able to scan those and think about things. But there's, a um, there's a principle that we, we use here in, at Edward Jones around being leader led and, you know, leader led to me is, you know, when you're talking with teams that you lead, it's, it's really around seeing that development 
is, is that person's own development and their, you know, their needs, you know, their aspirations are being talked about. And it's not just this very task driven, you know, I'm going to command you to do X and I want to know where, where Y is. It's, it's, it's around using more of a conversation when, when you're talking to people and, and keeping that focus on them as the person and their development. And, and I'd say along with that, it, it then starts to flow to empowerment, right? We're really big on seeing that decisions are closer to where the work is and empowering people. And with that empowerment, it builds trust, uh, but, but also a level of accountability, you know, with, with those teams that are, that are closer to the work. And I, I think it's, you know, in the last two years of my career, what I've learned here through through other leaders at, at this firm and, and their approach, um, has probably been more valuable than, than anything I've experienced in almost 30 years at, at other institutions. That initial new relationship from that point to trust, to empowerment, right? Do you have any insight or advice on dealing with those first let's just say a couple months for lack of a better time frame where you you can't just bring someone on day one and like fully and totally 100% trust them the trust is built through the act of delivering yeah so how do you get through that initial stage from new relationship to trust so i think new relationship it it's it just takes time right it takes time of seeing that things get done not you know not jumping to a preconceived notion not thinking you know many people that you interact with are going to have different styles some people are cranking out 10 things a day but you don't hear from them for two weeks and so when you touch base with them that's the time when you're like though the sort of the light bulb goes off and you start to realize oh wow they're they're just the person that doesn't need to be um you know, doesn't need to constantly reflect it or voice it up, everything that they're, you know, they're getting done and they're doing. And then you have, you know, other folks that every time they get one task done or deliver one thing, they, you know, they want to tell you about it. They want to, you know, and, and maybe seek some praise around it, but just let you know and be informed. I think it comes through understanding people's style and approach and, and even going through what I went through the last couple of months of saying that, okay, you were leading a large software team that I love these people. I developed a great rapport with all of them and here's a brand new team. And so, yeah, naturally I'm going through that phase now of, and, and it's not like they're new here. Some of them have been seasoned and been here a while. Some have only been here a couple of years, but it does just take time to get to understand everybody's, you know, style and approach. And you figure out where, you know, you need to lean in a little bit more with others or, you know, be that person that proactively, you know, checks in or proactively offer help. It's, it's, it's going to vary based on the people. How do you, do you have a formal way to set an expectation? I'll give you an example. Some people, a couple of years ago, I heard about this concept of a manager read me, yeah. right? Where essentially when new members join the team, the manager says, this is what I'm expecting. This is how I operate. This is how I think. I find that I've, I've never put that well, I put it together as an exercise. I've never used it consistently. I more so, because my company is smaller and my, you know, we're less than 20 people. I just have strong relationships with each individual. And, you know, I understand that obviously that's not scalable to the 30,000 people, but right now, right now it works. Do you have any sort of system that you use or is it just being close to people and getting to know them? I think it's, it's being close to people. Um, it's creating I'll, it's creating space and time to, to touch base. It's, it's creating space and time to have skip levels or double skip levels and meet different people across the, the organization. Um, you can glean quite a lot of information. You know, you may think something's going swimmingly well, or you may have a perception that something's not going so well. And if you broaden out your touch points of who you're going to talk to, casually check in with people, even, even sometimes just as simple as a team's message, right? So a, an instant message to members of the group, Hey, saw you in that presentation today. You really did a good, thank you so much for going through that with me. That was so helpful. Um, they might be surprised initially to hear from someone much more senior to them, 
but then that opens the door. How are you? How, what's going on? Do you want to have just a quick chat? If you ever need anything, I'm an, you know, reach out to me, please. I think you have to, as a leader with a large organization, you have to open yourself up to folks. And obviously the, the pandemic and people working from home and the hybrid model is, has, has changed that. You're not just walking the halls because everybody's on the same floor and checking in with folks. Um, you know, but through digital tools, we, we can do it now. Right. I, I think you, you have to not just make yourself available, but you have to proactively seek folks at, to check in with and talk to. That reminded me of a good point I had or question I had for you. A lot of the banks have been in the news lately. I didn't track which ones I've just yeah. sort of seen it existing about really pushing for return to office work. And I know you guys are a bank. What's your thoughts on that? So we've, and I'll, I'll speak from our, our technology organization, our digital organization. As, as we accelerated our own digital strategy, digital transformation, you know, we had to go across the country to, to hire people, you know, you know, historically, you know, I wasn't here at the time, but you know, majority of people were here in St. Louis at the Edward Jones headquarters, whether they were employees or contractors. And now we've got folks all over the country. And so, you know, I think it's important from time to time to bring those folks in where you can, you know, nothing beats having a drink or eating pizza together or going bowling or, or doing a team meeting. Um, but yeah, so we are, you know, we've got folks remote, we've got folks here in St. Louis, we've got, you know, folks working hybrid, but also, you know, now we have people we're partnering with globally, right? You know, people in Eastern Europe, engineers, you know, it, developers in, in India, and, and they may be, you know, through a, a third party firm, they're not employees of Edward Jones, but they're third parties, um, and, and really reaching out and extending that same relationship to from time to time to go to visit them in person, but using Zoom and, and including them, you know, in, in standups and meetings and et cetera. So, you know, we are, you know, the way I'd nail it is we're, we're, we're a hybrid shop. And so, you know, do, do I see people coming into the office more? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but for the folks that are spread around the country, it, they're not going to be able to do it, you know, in, unless there's, you know, a reason that we're, we're flying them all, all in, but you know, it's, and this, this is my personal view on it. You know, I looked at a lot, I've worked with a lot of really talented engineers in my career. I mean, really talented engineers that if you made their life miserable for five minutes, they could have five other firms, you know, waiting in the wings to pick them up. And, and this goes back to, you know, already the early 2000s when I was working on a global asset manager, you know, there are people that are really self-driven and they have to do some really complicated work and they do it best alone. But when stuff goes bump in the night and breaks, which it does, a trading system goes down, a money movement system goes offline and you got to react and you got to be quick. You know, those folks that are doing it and working from home or working remote, it, it, it eases a lot of their pain and, you know, of, of what they have to do by having that flexibility. I'm watching the time. I want to make yeah. sure we're respectful of that. Uh, I've got a couple of leadership questions, yeah. family type questions, if that's okay. Very cool. Okay. So if you were to copy and paste like one professional experience to your whole team out of your life, what would that be? Copy and paste. Yeah. Um, I share this with people a lot. Before I moved to California, that, that first large financial institution I was working for in New York, um, why am I not getting promoted? Why am I not getting promoted? I deserve to be promoted. So-and-so got promoted. Um, here I am, I'm, I'm reporting to somebody that's, you know, two levels above me. So, you know, patience, like cut, I would cut and paste patience and you need to take control of your own career and your own destiny. I didn't get this job because it acts, I didn't get this promotion because of so-and-so I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Well, you've got to own your own career and you've got to take, you know, responsibility for yourself. And, you know, I would say that those were things at that stage in my life. I was still in my, you know, late twenties and early thirties in that time. And it took me a lot of other life lessons to learn patience with my own career, but then also 
to stop being my, you know, I'd hate to say it, my own worst enemy um, and blaming other people or other situations rather than taking accountability for who I was and how I was acting. No, that's, I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> Just yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> preach Kevin, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as far as family and fitness and faith and all of that. So I'm assuming you have a family. I do. Right. Yeah. So how is that? You're a very fit guy, well-groomed individual. Uh, I think that that matters, honestly, because I think that people want to see themselves as better. They want to follow people who are often better than them. Um, at least that's in my experience. But I'm curious, how is your just, you can respond however you want yeah. to family, faith, fitness question. How has your family helped be helped you get to where you are in your career? Or how has that played a role in it and your fitness and all of that good stuff? Very open into question. I'll, I'll start with the fitness piece first. Um, I love going to bed early. I often tell people that I go to bed when most toddlers go to bed. Um, <laughs> and, and I think sleep is really, really important. And, you know, just in society, right, we all suffer from not getting enough of it. I think fitness is, is a big key to that. I'm a, I generally wake up you know, between 4.30 and 5 every day. I like to ease in slowly, drink some water, drink some coffee, read a little bit of the news, maybe do a little work and and then hit the gym. Days I don't work out in the morning, I I feel it. Even when I, I travel, I'm at home. And so fitness is, is important for the mind for me. It's really important. And it helps really allay, you know, a lot of stress that can come with these these this industry and this type of work. Um, and then the family piece of it. So I'm a, I'm a late dad in life. I have a, a little girl who's turning two, you know, on, on Friday, I'm, I'm 50 years old. And as scary as that was, you know, when I found out, you know, that my wife was pregnant, as excited, as nervous and scared I was, um, you know, I, I look back now and I go, I'm, I love being a dad at this age because I'm also a different person at this age. And I'm not saying I wouldn't have been, you know, a good dad when I was in my twenties or thirties, but my, I have the ability to, to structure and set my priorities in, in a much different manner now in life. And so, you know, work's important, family's important, faith is important, but that, you know, that little girl and, and my wife come before it all. That's amazing. So she's two. I've got a, a five-year... We just had a bunch of birthdays, but I have a five-year-old girl, a four-year-old boy, and a six-month-year-old boy. Or six-month-year-old. That's not a word. A six-month boy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What a blessing. I saw yes. I saw the pictures online. Oh, nice. Where yeah. did you see them? On like LinkedIn, Facebook, or... I, I think it was on your site, on the, oh, okay. on the modern CTO oh, I do have site. Some I think, on... Yeah, I thought they were... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Oh man, so you're you're definitely you're at, you're past the point of losing sleep, and you're into the walking around and yeah. talking now. You're starting to get to know her a little bit. That's the best part is when you start to see their personality start to emerge. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and you know, everybody says it, and it's so true. It goes so fast, and so you know, staying present, staying off the phone. You know, when I'm I'm with her, like just you know, be being present, being engaged. If people are interested in in working with your organization or with you, is there a careers page on Edward Jones or is. tech career specific page, or is it yeah. just the one for the whole company? No, there's. Um, I, I'm almost positive there's a section on our careers page um, that you can do the drop down, and it gives you the the tech roles. I think you'd see in most of those roles they're going to say you know, rem, you know, remote or you know, we can hire from from anywhere. Um, you know, we, we've still got so much going on at the firm that there's, you know, that there's, there's still a lot of amazing opportunities here for, for amazing people that are, you know, willing to really embrace the, the purpose and, and be genuine and, and be part of just an amazing, great team. I love it. So you can head over to edwardjones.com, check out the careers page, do some work with Kevin. Man, we made a podcast. How do you cool. feel? I feel good, man.